Our first piece of the second part of the lecture is Tamati Wakanene, which is an oil painting by Gottfried Lindauer. So Gottfried Lindauer was actually a Western painter and he set up his own portrait workshop back in Europe. And then he ended up moving to New Zealand later in his life. So he gained notoriety pretty quickly within the community by painting members of the Maori community. So you've probably heard the term Maori before. Um, it is a name that is used to reference a group of people that have occupied what is now called New Zealand for thousands of years. So this particular work is a portrait of a Maori chief um, painted posthumously. So whenever you see that word posthumous, that means it was painted after death. So there was actually a photograph that the artist used to create this piece. And what's pretty remarkable is that he never actually met this man. And he was only given a couple of photographs that look something like this to create this beautiful and extremely lifelike oil painting. So Lindauer um, trained as um, in the in the Renaissance naturalism style, which is obviously being emulated in this painting here. He worked on commissions as he traveled, oftentimes painting chieftains at their own request. So they saw these paintings and they saw that they had value and actually offered him resources and money to paint them. So to this is extremely important um, within the context of how Maori see objects. So to Maori people and their descendants, images of their ancestors and other objects that are passed down the family line, so the, a word that we use to describe that as heirlooms, are considered to be an embodiment of their spirit. It's like a relic. And they're oftentimes placed in family community centers and they're wept over, they're celebrated, um, they have meals around this portrait. It's, it's as if there is a part of their spirit, a part of their mana that is still residing within that artwork. So Tamati Watane, Watamakti who was a chief at the time when New Zealand was being colonized by white missionaries. So he actually converted to the Wesleyan faith. So there's several indications in this portrait that are indicative of Tamati Wakanene's status. He has a tewatewa, which is this staff-like weapon that he's grasping in his right hand. There is this green eye at the center. He's also wearing a cloak made out of kiwi feathers. He has a green stone earring. We see lots and lots of jade in these representations of prominent people within the Maori community. His perhaps most obvious status symbol, however, are his tamoko, which are basically his facial tattoos. So facial tattoos are a symbol of status in many Maori communities. They are still practiced today. Typically, men of high status will have tattoos covering their entire face, uh, except for their lower eye sockets and ears, whereas women will typically have to tattoos that are around their lips and chin. So what's really interesting when you look at portraits that were painted by Gottfried Lindauer is that you see some portraits of important Maori individuals in what we would consider their native garb. But we also see images of these important people in Western garb as well. And I wanted to show you a couple of examples on the following slides. So these images are, again, exemplifying the, the degree of detail and the, the attention and care that Gottfried Lindauer really paid towards his subjects. I hesitate to draw connections to George Catlin, who you'll recall painted images of Native Americans in a couple of units ago, because these images seem particularly dignified. However, you do see similar motifs of the mouths being closed, the frontal pose. It, it tends to be kind of this, this overarching trend when white people paint non-white non people. But in any case, you'll notice that the individual on the left right here, Te Pae Hinerangi, is painted in native dress. She has this green stone amulet around her neck, as well as this kind of like poncho-like garment. 
whereas the figure on the right is in a distinctly Western garb. So interestingly enough, and this was somewhat ironic, when Western patrons said, I want an individual, I want a painting of an individual, it was tip they typically requested it in a more native garb. This is something that was more expected in the West. However, when a Maori individual or their family commissioned a portrait, they typically requested it in Western garb. So there's a bit of a switcheroo here in terms of what was perceived as being valuable within a community. So there's this great video on Samoan tattooing. So tattooing is not a practice that is limited to the Maori of New Zealand. You'll see lots of different tattooing practices across the Pacific Islands. It's similar to tapa in that it's this art form that has many different names and many different iterations scattered throughout the Pacific Islands. It's kind of a shared element of culture. There was this great video on the PBS series Civilizations that talked about um, kind of like the context of Gottfried Lindauer and his legacy and the legacy that his portraits have, specifically within the descendants of the family of this Maori chieftain named Te Rangunyatu. Unfortunately, Netflix removed Civilizations, so I do not believe that the video is available. All right, moving on to our next work. So, Papua New Guinea, this is an area that's typically referred to as New Ireland. Um, this is a Mawangan display in masks. So the ceremony involving this ma these masks is extremely, extremely elaborate. It involves the creation of these extremely intricately carved masks. This is all wood. You can see that there's a lot of negative space in here. This is a lot of labor, a lot of effort. There were also these massive feasts that were associated with these ceremonies. So oftentimes, these ceremonies would take place months or even years after the people they were intended to celebrate actually passed away. So the ceremony itself was basically a send-off to the dead. It was more or less a sort of funeral. It was basically a way to free the living of the obligation of serving their family members. So the masks, as you'll notice, are incredibly intricate and they liberally use negative space. There's extremely skilled use of wood crafting here. And what's super interesting too is that no two masks are exactly the same. So it's in this community, you basically, when you create a mask, you basically have a patent on it. There's no other mask that can be made exactly quite like it. So you can't really see it in these images, but typically Malangan masks were set in a wooden white canoe and they were, after the ceremony, they were left to rot. So it's very similar to a couple of the other masks that we covered from the continent of Africa where once they have been involved in the ritual, they no longer have the same significance. So these masks are commissioned by the family members of the deceased um, to skilled artisans. And again, you're, you can imagine that people in Melanesia don't actually look like, it, look like this. So there's this notion of creating this spiritual resemblance rather than a physical, like true to life resemblance, something that we're used to in the Western world. It's meant to represent their soul. You'll oftentimes see animal motifs in a lot of these masks. They're highly abstracted, so you'll have to forgive me, I'm not able to identify all of them. But a lot of times these animal elements will represent um, an affiliation to a certain family or a certain clan within the community. There's also lots of different hairstyles that are being used in these Melangan masks. Some of them are made out of feathers. Some of them are made out of fibers. And one of the most unique of these is this kind of like feather, feathery mohawk. Typically, you'll see the colors black, red, and yellow, which are associated with war and magic in many parts of the Pacific, including Papua New Guinea. And these exaggerated facial features, such as enlarged nose and lips and elongated earlobes. This is not the last time that we'll see these kinds of features in masks. Moving on to our next work. So the Torres Strait is basically the area between Papua New Guinea and continental Australia. 
This mask is particularly unique in that it's made out of turtle shell. This is a precious material. Turtles are not a dime a dozen nowadays in the Pacific Ocean, and they certainly weren't, weren't 100 or 200 years ago either. Most masks from the Pacific were made of wood when it was available, so you can consider something particularly important if it's made out of turtle shell. This particular tradition of creating masks out of turtle shell in this community goes back several hundred years. So this mask, um, like many other masks that have we have been presented in the AP curriculum, were used as a part of a costume that was then itself part of a larger ritual. So the rituals associated with this particular mask included things like male initiation rites, funerals, um, rites to encourage good harvests and hunts. There's also evidence to suggest that these masks were also used to play out narratives about deified ancestors and culture heroes. So these ceremonies were extremely performative. Oftentimes the dancers would wear outfits made out of fibers. Um, there's lots of music involved, and again, they're recreating these elements of their cultural narrative. So a lot of the ancestral beings have a specific species of animal associated with them. You can see that there is this human element to this piece, but there's also this um, animal element on the very top right here, this frigate bird with its wings outstretched right here. So some of these masks will include exclusively animal imagery. I'll show you a couple of examples. Some of them will include exclusively human imagery, and then some, like this, will incorporate elements of both. So this mask might have actually been used to reenact the narrative of the person that it depicted right here, which was probably, again, a deified ancestor. So a couple of other things pertaining to the material. So we know that this is turtle shell, but a lot of times students don't understand the significance of these feathers up here. So to give you a sense of how difficult it was to obtain these kinds of feathers, these came from a bird called a cassowary, which are notorious in Australia for being particularly violent and dangerous. Just a couple of months ago, there was a guy in Florida, because where else? that was actually killed by his pet cassowary. So cassowaries are one of the ways that I can definitely see a connection between dinosaurs and birds because this is a cassowary foot right here and that's a, an adult human hand. So they're extremely dangerous. They have these killer claws. Sometimes they'll just like come up on the beaches in Australia and steal your grapes. So you better watch out for cassowaries. So here's a couple of the other examples of book masks. This is a crocodile mask right here. Again, we're seeing this element of multimedia art. We have feathers, we have wood, we have elements of tortoise shell here, we have fibers. And then here's another face mask right here. We can see lots of similarities between these two masks and the first one in this use of negative space, these repeating triangular elements as well as the use of tortoise shell, or turtle shell, rather. It is a multimedia performance. It involves a couple of aspects of things that we've discussed before pertaining to Pacific art. So when Queen Elizabeth II was crowned queen in the 1950s, she went on a royal tour of what were then various territories that were colonies of Britain. So Fiji was one of those colonies. So in this particular instance, when she visited Fiji, she was given this royal welcome. In this particular case, we see a procession of Fijian women carrying these woven mats, which are called, they're just regular mats. I always get this confused, as you can probably tell. Um, these right here are called Masi. They're basically the Fijian version of a tapa, which is again that mulberry bark cloth that has been painted in a specific orientation. So these mats are different from tapas. That's really important to remember. Um, these mats are made using this reed-like plant. Um, the 
fibers are woven in these crisscross patterns to create these mats that have alternating colors, usually like a darker color and the more natural color. What you'll notice is that the mats in this particular image are relatively plain. So with Fijian philosophy, less is more. The simpler the design, the more meaningful and significant the object is. So you can imagine that for this royal procession, they are giving Queen Elizabeth II the, the highest honor in the presentation of their mats. So while Queen Elizabeth was in Fiji, she participated in many different aspects of Fijian community ceremonies, one of which was the kava ceremony. So they basically sat down for afternoon tea, but this tea is mildly hallucinogenic and basically has the effects of a milder version of cannabis. So the queen basically got high in Fiji. There were also various dances and songs that were part of this visit. So you'll notice when you look at the masa that you're seeing lots of geometric and floral motifs very similar to the hiapo tapa that we saw from Niue in Polynesia. Typically these designs would be made by hand painting or by using stamps. So the creation of these mats, as you can see in this bottom image, are really a community activity, especially for larger mats. Women would come together in the community and they would all work on a mat simultaneously. So this, this aspect of community is, is really important in a lot of Pacific cultures. We will also see this with the Easter Island Moai on the next slide. So these mats um, are still made in Fiji for important events like weddings and funerals. They're similar to tapas in that they can oftentimes be used as currency or used to celebrate important events. All right, for our last work, you're probably at least somewhat familiar with Easter Island Moai. So it's really important in this case to recognize that with this artwork, the platform or ahu that these moai are standing on are just as important as the moai themselves. So there are about 900 of these statues on Rapa Nui, which is known to, in the West as Easter Island, each of which weighs about 50 tons. So most are made out of tuff, which is this kind of compressed volcanic ash. You'll notice when you look at this image right here that it looks kind of worn away. But a couple um, were made of basalt, which is this tougher, um, more difficult to work material, which is not really that forgiving. So you can imagine that if a person was able to commission something out of basalt, that they were a pretty high rank in their community. So this particular figure right now here is known as Hoa Haka Nanayana, which translates to lost or stolen friends. So this piece is currently at the British Museum, so you can kind of understand the nomenclature here. So the vast majority of these statues are male and the vast majority of them faced inland to watch over the people of the island. There was white coral placed in the eye sockets of the statues to awaken them in their original context. So this is what a lot of them actually originally looked like right here. So the platforms that these statues are standing on are basically funeral pyres. A lot of them are made with stone that's mixed with the ashes from cremations. So the Rapa Nui people were among many island cultures that practiced ancestral veneration. In this particular case, the ancestors that were being venerated were the people that first arrived to Rapa Nui around a thousand years ago. So there's this deification of the ancestors. So when you look at these statues, you'll notice that the heads are quite large, taking up around a half of the body's total height. Um, they have these very long, prominent foreheads, large eyes, large noses, and these long, drooping earlobes. The arms are carved in low relief on the sides. Oftentimes you'll see some like rudimentary vestiges of hands and fingers. And then a couple of statues also have these top knots on them. It's kind of like a hairstyle. 
So Easter Island, like many island communities, had an extremely fragile ecosystem that was unfortunately ravaged by this devastating like ecological impact of invasive species. So when the British came here, they brought lots of invasive species, particularly rats, that completely destroyed the ecosystems. A lot of the statues basically fell over or were left to the ravages of nature. Um, recently, there's been a couple of artists, particularly from South America, that have come over and restored a lot of the statues to their original orientations, particularly because this is one of the sources of income for the island currently. But there are no full-blooded Rapa Nui left. They were basically um, converted to Christianity. A lot of them were sold into slavery. And a lot of them perished when the island ecosystem collapsed. What it also happened is that a lot of the oral traditions and local history of the Rapa Nui was destroyed when these people were sold into slavery, um, when a lot of their ancestral items were destroyed. So there's a lot of mystery surrounding these particular items. One thing I wanted to bring up is that a lot of people, particularly in the West, are really skeptical whenever they see a community, particularly of brown people or black people, creating something monumental. So one of the examples of people not really taking oral history seriously comes into play with these Easter Island Moai. So when there's this anecdotal story of when the Christians came, like the, the Christians and the, the white settlers came to Rapa Nui, they asked, as many I'm sure would ask, how the heck did you move these things? Because they were built primarily in these quarries that were on the like different parts of the island and they had to be moved somehow from those quarries to be in an upright orientation. So the locals said, they walked. And of course, these Westerners were like, yeah, right, they did not walk. But recently, like in the last couple of decades, there was this researcher that completely reconstructed a Moai statue and then also used this technique that was mentioned, this walking technique, and lo and behold, they could actually move the statue. So just because white people couldn't do it doesn't mean it was aliens. So what's super cool is that there's some evidence that the people that moved these statues actually had songs and chants that they used to coordinate the movement of these statues. So you can imagine it's kind of like a heave-ho. You have to be extremely coordinated if you're going to move this thing that weighs 50 tons.